What's overthrowing my democratically elected state? Uh, I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, a podcast about the worst people in all of history. And uh, we are, of course, recording in the immediate wake of what I think can fairly be called an insurrection uh, by fascist dominated right wing militants. Um, and in the immediate wake of that, uh, I sat down with my producer, Sophie. Sophie, uh, say hi. Hello, friends. Now, n- not literally sit down together because of no. the plague, but we, we got on a text chat and I was like, you know, this fascist insurrection against a democratically elected government has a lot of similarities with other fascist insurrections against democratically elected governments. Perhaps mm-hmm. we should talk about the history of fascist insurrections against democratically elected governments in order to better prepare people for what needs to be done in the wake of this to stop them from succeeding the next time. Yes. And of course, once we had that idea, the only person we could possibly bring on was our good friend Jason Petty, aka Prop. What up? What the lick, Reed? What's up with that failed nation state? How y'all feeling? <laughs> Quite literally. Yeah. I, I I think I text Prop and I was like, "Hey, I want to do this," and like it was like, "Yes." Yeah, no brainer. <laughs> <laughs> there's like, there's so like, you know, Robert, myself, anybody else who has like a seventh grade level understanding of history has been like kind of flaring their arms like the crazy <laughs> scientists in every movie that's like y'all the aliens are coming guys i don't understand how come nobody is seeing us telling y'all we're standing on our heads yelling at you like this is point for point like <laughs> bar for bar point for point we've seen this before and i don't understand what you don't understand yeah uh, how how did this because I've been warning about this for quite a while, and that, uh, it, that it could happen here. That it could happen here, and yeah. people continuously are like, "I can't believe you predicted this." And it's like nobody predicted this. Everyone no. who was paying attention was like, "Oh, this is obviously going to happen." Yes, because <laughs> thousands of people are promising to do this. <laughs> yes, it's like it's a dog. My favorite one, my favorite meme going around was uh one with with Ron Burgundy. He was like, wow, that escalated slowly <laughs> yeah. over the past 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. I can't believe these people did exactly what they said they was going to do. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, the reason we decided to do the special miniseries behind the insurrections is that I think that's historical. That's the name, by the way. That's yeah. what this is called that you're listening to. Give it insurrection. That's your yeah. Question. Yeah. You and I did a similar thing last year when the uprising yeah. against the police started, where we kind of talked about the history of the police. And I thought that was useful to inform people both the context of why folks were angry for a mm-hmm. lot of folks who maybe had never really thought that much about the police and didn't understand all the the hatred. Um, and I also thought it was useful because understanding, you know, the history of something that you want to fight is useful in fighting it, um, yeah. whether it's the police state or a fascist insurrection and yeah. understanding what other fascists have done throughout history and where they've succeeded and failed and how the people opposing those fascists have succeeded or failed is important both for us to know what's coming next and to avoid making the same mistakes that other people made in the past that led to them being ruled by fascists, which I'd like to avoid. So naturally, I would love to avoid that. So naturally, we're going to start with Rome, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We're going to be starting with my old friend, uh, Benito M. Um... (laughs) <laughs> Big Benny, uh, Big, as no one has Big ever Benny called Moo. him. Yeah, Benny, Moo. <laughs> Big Benny Moo. Yeah, Big Benny Moo. Yeah, Big Benny Moo. Yeah, yeah. The thing, the thing that I like, I, I mean, we gonna get into this, but like off jump, the the in in my hopes to like, you know, help people figure out ways to inroads to, you know, their family members who have been cooked by this like fascist movement is like is is dig inside of you and understand what it feels like to be disenfranchised and what it feels like to feel like you've been left behind by those that are supposed to take care of you. And if you can understand that, you know, coupled with a person having really non-powerful antennas to know that they being fed bullshit, you know what I'm saying? Um, then I feel like, 
you're you're like you're you're starting to get an owner's manual as to like how to not let yourself in you trying to stop a fascist regime, not incensing and creating martyrs out of them and, and confirming their feelings that uh you know, everybody against them. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's a matter of like getting behind that and being like, okay, it, if this election was stolen, that would suck. Mm-hmm. You're right. That would suck if that was true. It's yeah. just not though. It's not. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, it's not. Yeah. It's just not. It's though. like with yeah. QAnon. Yeah. I mean, if a bunch of Satan worshiping pedophile wizards were eating yeah. all of our children, that would be a problem. We should fight that. <laughs> but that's not happening. It's just not true, bro. Yeah. 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 The real pedophiles in power are more like the guy you think is the second coming. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. So let's 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 talk about old old Benito Mussolini. Um, I started thinking about Benito as I was watching live stream footage of people mm-hmm. breaking through the Capitol barricades and into offices with zip ties and weapons. Um, and I I know that while this was happening, in the immediate wake of it, a lot of people started bringing up historical comparisons. And unfortunately, I think a ton of those historic comparisons were were bad, were the wrong yeah. ones to make. A good yeah. example Sorry. of this would be a ton of people who compared the events of the 6th to Kristallnacht, uh, the Night yeah. of Broken Glass. Yeah. Um, and I think everyone here knows what that is. For those that don't, yeah. listening, it was a pogrom, which is a, a racial, a mass racial assault, like on members of a specific race, basically, yeah. um, that was instituted by the Nazi government against Jewish people in Germany. Hundreds of synagogues and Jewish owned businesses were burnt down in the space of a night. Um, hundreds of people were killed. Um, and it was a nationwide racial attack carried out at the government's behest. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's not what we saw on the six. That's not this. Right? Nah. <laughs> That's not it's, this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, probably the most prominent person to make that comparison was our current governor, our former governor of California and current Arnold mm-hmm. Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, whose video otherwise had some really good stuff in it I, about. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I kind of dig it in the sense yeah. of like the way he was talking about the remorse mm-hmm. of people that was a part of it. I think if he was going to pull the Austria card, like it would have been a better Although I uh, Mussolini's a, a better um parallel, but yeah, when um when they burnt the parliament right before yes. uh, yeah, that's a more better comparison, yes. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, than Crystal. Than, uh, yeah, than Crystal. Absolutely. Not, but, Schwarzen- but yeah, yes. Schwarzenegger has great TikTok content. He's got like a pet donkey that follows him around. I'm sure he it. does. Look I'm it sure up. he does. For a laugh. He's definitely like the like the meme of like, you know when it's heartbreaking that the worst person, you yeah. know, makes an excellent point. <laughs> makes a like, really good yes, point. Exactly. Freak, man. Yeah. A great point, bro. God. Yeah. And I think his best point was just like how, you know, the victims of fascism continued long after the war, yes. including the children of Nazis who, yes. you know, were abused by parents yes. and stuff. Great point to make wrong about Kristallnacht. When yeah. we're talking about actually good historic comparisons and valuable ones to what happened on the sixth in DC, there are a few, uh, one of them, as you noted, was the, the burning of the Austrian parliament, which I think yeah. we're going to talk about a, a, a bit later in this series. Mm-hmm. Um, but and uh, other folks have kind of much more aptly, I think, compared what happened in the sixth to uh, the Munich Beer Hall Putsch, uh, which was yeah, Adolf yeah, Hitler's yeah. first attempt to seize power. And yeah. there's a lot of good reasons to compare that to the sixth. It's not really a perfect comparison. None of them are, um, in part because it, when Hitler tried to overthrow the government starting in Munich, he was a political rabble rouser with no power who was trying to spark a mass revolution. And on January 6th, it was like tens of thousands of the president's fans, including a lot of police officers, active duty soldiers and elected yeah. leaders who tried to take over the Capitol. Mm-hmm. It's a bit different. Yeah. So if we're looking for a better historic parallel to January 6th, I, I think we might be better served by going back a year before the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch, when a completely different fascist, Benito Mussolini, led what came to be known as the March on Rome. Yeah. Um, a lot of really good comparisons to what's <sighs> happened, a lot of good lessons in the March on yeah. Rome. Um, so uh, most it's people- It's also good, before you start, is- yeah, yeah. Just if you could, it's you never really want to like reach into the past and draw like direct lines, right? If you will, but if you could think to yourself, just as a general grid, if in the story you on the side of Mussolini, you probably on the wrong side of history. I think we can say that completely. So now, as you continue, think about your position in this, yeah. And you, that might be able to tell you which side of history you should be on right now. Anyway, go. It, 
And if you're if you're rightfully on the side of history, that's like, well, I don't want to stand with Mussolini, which I think the vast I, 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 I think the vast majority of people listening to this are already there. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the things this teaches is why the people who didn't want Mussolini to wind up in charge failed, yeah. you know, yes. and, and it's important to know that as well. Yes. Right. Um, yes. So. Most people are probably broadly familiar of Benito Mussolini, um, but because of how history went down, he tends to be remembered mostly as like Hitler's ridiculous and kind of sad sidekick, like yeah. the least threatening dictator on the <laughs> Axis side. Um, Mussolini doesn't wind up as like the frightening villain in a lot of movies, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, that's good. I never thought of it like that, but yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, you're just like, oh, you, oh yeah, you Hitler light. Mm-hmm. <laughs> unless she was yeah. in, unless she was in unless she was in uh italy you know? yeah i mean even then italy would have been it would have been better to be you know a jewish person in italy than in yeah, germany sure. not a high bar you know <laughs> the lowest bar in lowest history actually ever, yeah. the bare minimum <laughs> yeah. yeah um but yes, he he gets this kind of reputation of just being like incompetent and the junior partner to Hitler and not very frightening yeah. and that really misses a lot of the history and what what people at the time when Mussolini rose to power thought because Hitler actually in some ways idolized Mussolini um, and yeah. he patterned his career off of Mussolini's career. The Munich Beer Hall putsch was inspired directly by the March on Rome. Mm-hmm. Mussolini was not just the first um, – like Mussolini was the first fascist dictator. He was the yeah. man who created fascism as a political ideology that actually took power. Right. We talked wow. about Gabriel D'Annunzio, who kind of invented a lot of the ideas that became fascism uh-huh. as a, and who was a, a contemporary of Mussolini's. Mm-hmm. But Mussolini is the guy who made fascism work for the first time. And when I say yeah. work, I mean actually seized power, not that yeah. it was a good government or anything. Yeah. Um, he was the first fascist who seized power from a functional democracy. So he's he is not an incompetent buffoon. And you kind no. it, you you it behooves you to understand how he succeeded in the way yeah. that he did. Um, we're going to do a full set of episodes on his life at some point on Behind the Bastards. But since we're just focused on the March on Rome today, I'm going to give a little Cliff's Notes of Benito's life prior okay. to him coming to power. How so fun. Benito Amilcar Andrea Mussolini, which is quite a name. Yo, um, that is a mafia boss right there. Yeah, except for yes. the Andrea, right? Except for the bit. Andrea. Yeah, that's a little <laughs> that's when he got When he got baptized, yeah. in his christening, they gave him Andrea. Yeah, either that or it's like a boy named Sue situation, and it turns out that's actually a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he was born on July 29th, 1883, in a small Italian town that I'm not going to try to pronounce right now. His father, <laughs> Alessandro, was a blacksmith and a socialist. He named Benito after Mexican President Benito Juarez, who's the namesake of Juarez, and who was the Oof. first indigenous president of Mexico, um, and was a, a famous liberal, you know? Yeah. Um, I thought that was interesting. I had no idea. That's super interesting, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in 1902, so that's like his background. He was very left-wing, right? Like, your your parents are naming you after the liberal indigenous president of Mexico. That's that's quite a thing. That's a flex right there, man. That's quite a thing. What a pivot. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, yeah. this guy is one of the great all-time historic <laughs> yeah. pivots, you know? Yeah. Um, in 1902, Benito fled to Switzerland to avoid compulsory military service. He became active in the Italian socialist movement from afar, and he grew obsessed with the writing of syndicalist Georges Morel, who believed that capitalist democracy needed to be overthrown by a combination of general strikes and violent direct action. So mm-hmm. he's, he's a socialist, he's a leftist, but he's a fan of these guys who are like, we need a revolution, and violence is okay in that revolution, right? That's like a big, big chunk of his early ideological upbringing. Yeah. In 1904, Benito returned to Italy under a general amnesty for draft dodgers, in exchange for which he, uh, he had to serve in the military for two years. He did his time, he got out, and he became a left-wing journalist and a firebrand, participating in a 1911 riot protesting Italy's imperialist war in Libya. Uh, he did nine, or five months in prison for this. So... Wow. Not just like a talker, like he puts yeah. his skin in the game and he does time protesting an imperialist war. Dang. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was, he was not like wishy-washy about this stuff, I guess is the point I'm making. So as a hardcore leftist, Mussolini hated the monarchy, which in Italy at the time was similar in its kind of power to the British monarchy. Italy is a constitutional monarchy at this point, so more or less a democracy, but they've got a king and he has some power. Um, In 1912, Mussolini stated, the king is nothing more than a useless citizen and the Italian flag is fit only for a dung heap. Sheesh. 
Yeah. Burn it all down. Mussolini. Burn it all down kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Very much. Okay. Very much. Now, it, it may seem odd that the first fascist dictator was a committed left-wing activist yeah. in his youth, but it's really not that strange. This is a pattern that we see repeating itself over and over throughout the history of fascism. In more recent times, just to talk about stuff that's happened in the last, like, four years, Jason Kessler, who's the, the mm, fascist yep. who planned and organized the first Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, got his start in political activism at Occupy in New York. You can find in Unicorn Riot's Discord chats him talking about being very into Occupy at the time. Wow. Um, Andrew Arenheimer, Weave, who's a neo-Nazi hacker and a prominent member of the fascist movement in this country, claims to have been an organizer at Occupy Wall Street. I found discussions in Unicorn Riot's archive where Weave debates with other Nazis who were there about how Occupy could have been handled differently and been more successful. And for a lot of these Nazis, the failure of the Occupy movement to garner any real change and the ease with which the police swept it aside were major factors in radicalizing these guys to the far right. One mm. fascist that I found in a Discord conversation said, Said, quote, I was at Occupy Wall Street in 2011. It was black pilling as fuck, by which he means the experience was so disheartening that it pushed him towards fascism. Um, yeah. And that's really what we see with Mussolini. Yeah. Um, He's very involved in left-wing politics. He gets arrested for them, and he he sees them continue to fail, right? They're, they don't succeed in overthrowing the government. They don't succeed in pushing the changes that he believes are necessary, and it starts to embitter him. I, I I often think that yeah. like some of that happens in the black community mm -hmm. with just also like like still trying to wrap my brain around like saw a video of Crips for Trump on the on the uh <laughs> at the at the at the at the insurrection earlier. It was mm -hmm. like Crips for Trump, West Side, something, something. And I I and I could not wrap my brain around like how this will work. But I think it's it I think a lot of it does have to do with the fact that like you know, we've tried so hard. We put our flag in the sand with this particular way of approaching, you know, political change and it not working that you're like, well, forget it, you know, and then like, well, maybe this will work. Maybe this going this direction speaks more to like since the empire, the machine just met us with might and just overpowered us with might because they just they're just more powerful. Y'all only recourses to be like well i need to be more powerful than that i yeah. some i don't know I yes mean, yes that's exactly yeah when you when you're i think you're really on to something like when you're when you're getting your ass kicked and i, I think some of this is like i think it's probably more common with males who are kind of in males, activism yes. like and you get your pride is harmed yeah by, the, by getting the shit kicked out of you repeatedly by the repeated failure to win, to advance um, by the, yeah. the sheer strength of your opponents. I do think that that can have the effect of pushing people in that kind of more violent authoritarian direction yeah. where you're like, well, I just want to win. Yeah. Like, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that has, if that's a part of what's going on. And mm -hmm. I, I think it is for Mussolini because the switch yeah. for him really happens as a result of World War I. Um, so basically what you've got with World War I, Archduke Franz Ferdinand gets shot uh, dead along with his wife yeah. and it starts this this series of events right um where austria is going to invade serbia and russia mm -hmm. is going to come in on the side of and back up uh, and like it, it starts this whole domino effect and so there's months between his assassination and the actual outbreak of the war where everyone knows that europe is gearing up for a war yeah and prior to that happening the international left the communist international largely had been very anti-war very united across national boundaries but as soon as a mass european war becomes a reality shit starts to splinter and there are a lot of folks who had been socialist leftists like workers who instead of kind of siding with workers solidarity are like well i'm gonna side with my country on yes. this. Um, and, you know, that's not the only thing that's happening. There's also like this, the second international tries to organize like some sort of worker strike or something like there's a couple of ideas about how they might stop the war by organizing yeah. workers. And all of these ideas fail. Um, and, uh, you know, all of these ideas fail and Europe lurches towards war. And it's kind of like this moment where this big international left wing movement shows it that it's toothless. In yeah. the eyes of at least of a, uh, the eyes of a guy like Mussolini, like we said, yeah. like this, we weren't going to let this kind of thing happen, and he, and now it's happening. Yeah. Um. 
So that that for one thing is a source of frustration to a lot of people. Um, Mussolini is more directly enraged by something that happens earlier in 1914, um, something called Red Week, which was when a bunch of workers there was a big mass workers revolt in Italy that was brutally put down by Italian police and the Royal Army, um, and this had kind of convinced him that the bourgeoisie leaders of left wing political parties, the actual like liberals and socialists in government, yeah. didn't really support revolution, and he yeah. did. So all of this stuff is kind of in the mix, leading to him getting kind of blackpilled, to use yeah. the words of that other Nazi. Yeah. Um, and Benito doesn't come out as against the war as a result of this. Instead, he decides to become incredibly pro-war because mm -hmm. he thinks it's going to accelerate the collapse of the Italian state and lead to a revolution, right? Yeah. Um, so in mid-September, after Italy announced her neutrality in the war, uh, Benito tells the staff of the newspaper he worked at, uh, Avanti, which was a socialist paper, that he'd become convinced that war alone could bring revolution to Italy. Um, so yeah, he's kind of like an accelerationist. We need to go to war because yeah. that's going to force a revolution. It's the only way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, when you, it's, it's, I've always, in, at least in my head, like, I've, I've kind of let go of the, like, linear swing of, like, you know, far right, far left in my brain. I know we use that because that's how we understand the world right now, but, like, it seems much more, like, circular to where it's, like, uh, they end at authoritarianism at the end of the day, they end with a, with a strong dude. Like, so, so it was crazy. Like, yeah. So like the further left you go, you're still going to end at a dude overpowering. Everyone. I think, yeah, so I, 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 th I, which I was going to say, which, which, why, like I'm now leaning more towards thinking in anarchist ways of being like, you got to get off this loop. It's just this, the, the whole, it's there. We're going to land in the same place at some point. Somebody's yeah. going to get oppressed, you know? Yeah. yeah. And what your, so there's a couple of things, a couple of terms that are used a lot for the kind of thought process that you just explained. One of them is horseshoe theory, which is this idea that the left yeah. and the right, when you go far enough, come around to the same place. And I, I don't subscribe to that because I don't think that left-wing ideals and far-right ideals are super similar. But I do think that what you see that looks like that, the reason why the far left and say Soviet Russia under Stalin and yeah. the totalitarianism of Hitler have a lot yeah. of similarities and similar body counts is because authoritarians always that's end what i'm up trying to say place. yeah exactly like, exactly it's the authoritarian. And it's authoritarian left authoritarian right and mussolini is always an authoritarian leftist so it's yeah. easy to go authoritarian right yeah if you're anti-authoritarian it's a lot harder to wind up at that we should that's have a dictator place yeah, yeah, that's what yeah I'm absolutely so you need to get yeah. off the loop because if it yeah. ends at authoritarianism mm -hmm. then this is not where i need to be yeah, yeah, exactly. If it ends with like all of the power being in one dude or a tiny number of people's hands, yeah, no, it's just that's not, not it's what like, I want. No, it's what I'm trying to. This, it's like yeah. somewhere on this horseshoe, I knew that that wasn't a good idea. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. We need to get off the ride. And and yes. Mussolini is very much just a guy who he he he's he's of that he's 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 always been kind of an authoritarian yeah. um in part because he is very in love with his own ideas and thinking and that's the same when he's on the left as when he's on the right mm -hmm. and you know it's not a clean process of him going from socialist to fascist but it happens over the course of not just world war 1 but ramping up to getting italy involved in world war 1 so yeah. italy had prior to the outbreak of hostilities been allied with the um the central powers so they should have come in the war on germany's side but they very intelligently were like nah no nah, we're not <laughs> we're not doing this this yeah, doesn't yeah, yeah, seem yeah, like yeah, a yeah. good idea yeah but and that's why so they say we're not getting involved in the war and mussolini becomes a pro-war activist trying to force Italy to come into the war on the side of the allies. So fighting mm -hmm. against the people they'd been allied with before. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to quote now from a write-up in 1914 to 1918 online, which is a World War I encyclopedia. It's a very good resource on all this. Wow. After his late October editorial demanded Italian intervention, socialist outrage prompted Mussolini's resignation, so he's forced to resign from the party he'd been a member of. When his pro-interventionalist newspaper, Il Popolo d'Italia, the Italia, the, the Italian people, I think is well what done. it stands for. Yeah, not. Uh, appeared in mid-November. The party expelled him. Mussolini concealed its funding by industrialists, the French, his wealthy lover Margarita Safrati, and possibly Russian agents. For six months, through editorials and demonstrations, he promoted the 
interventionalist movement, collaborating with syndicalist Filippo Corradoni. Mussolini demanded war against Italy's allies, Germany and Austria-Hungary, to demolish bulwarks against European revolution. A victorious war would forge a national mass movement demanding political change. If the government rejected war, Mussolini threatened revolution. Most Italians favored peace, but Vittorio Emmanuel III, king of Italy, forced a war declaration on 24th of May, 1915. So... There's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening there. One of them is that Mussolini has an ideological reason for wanting war because he thinks it's going to yeah. lead to revolution. Another is yeah. that he's very likely getting paid yes. by foreign <laughs> powers in order to incite Italy to come in on their side. Yeah. Um, kind of like our ad sponsors who pay us. You know who does come in sponsored violence against... Okay. Nope. Trying to accelerate nope. our wallets. Uh, yeah. 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 Accelerate your wallets. Uh, accelerate our collapse. wallets, Robert. Yeah. Our accelerate wallets. our wallets. Our personal wallets. There we go. We can't. We hit it. We we landed on it. Here's products. Oh, we're back. Um. So yeah, we're we're talking about. Mussolini becomes this very much like uh, interventionalist figure and there's a mix of ideology and foreign backing that kind of pushes him towards it. And I could talk about websites like the Gray Zone and their weird Russian funding and how they're ostensibly left wing but also pro imperialist intervention when some countries do it. But I won't because we need to move on to the story of Benito Mussolini. But yeah. we've seen these patterns happen recently as well. Yeah. So Mussolini was obviously just one very prominent voice in favor of war. He was a major pro-war figure, but he was probably, he was not the only one. Uh, and he was probably less influential than Gabriel D'Annunzio, who again, we covered in a two-parter that I'd recommend people listen to. Yeah. And to his minimal credit, after helping to monger his nation into war, Mussolini joined the army and fought as a Bersaglia uh, he, which is like a, a marksman. It's almost like okay, a special like, forces yeah, unit, right? Okay. Like it's an elite military unit, right. um, kind of like the army rangers, it seems. Okay. Um, and he was wounded at the front by an exploding mortar in one of Italy's many bloody stalemates with Austria. Since he'd become a very public face of the pro-war movement, the king came to visit him twice while he was in the hospital. Benito became a bona fide celebrity, and when the war ended, this provided him with a great deal of political capital. He moved further and further right, pulled in by the spell of Gabriel D'Annunzio's proto-fascist rhetoric. When Italy was screwed over by her allies with the spoils of war, because like Italy had come in on the side of the allies, but they didn't really get shit at the end of it. Like they won a lot yeah. more territory, more of Austria, yeah. and they kind of got fucked out of it. Yeah. Um, and that pisses off the Italian right, who feel like we fought and bled and lost our comrades for this, and we didn't get anything, and it's because of our lame ass left wing government. Um, mm. That's how a lot of folks feel. Um, yeah. And yeah, Mussolini becomes is basically by the time the war ends is is pretty entrenched in the growing far right in Italy. And he supports Gabriel D'Annunzio when D'Annunzio leads an army of Italian special forces veterans to occupy the city of Fiume. Um, and this is, we again, we talk about this in our episodes on D'Annunzio, but Fiume is this city that was part of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia gets created at when yeah. World War One ends, uh -huh. and they get this city that Italy thought should be theirs. So D'Annunzio leads an army of retired special forces veterans to take it. And they turn it into this weird, it's like this melting pot because in, you know, 1918, 1919, you've got all these ideologies that are like still kind of forming anarchism and communism and fascism yeah. are popular in a lot of like similar circles of people. There's a lot of interplay between them at this period because they're all kind yeah. of new ideologies being developed and the same kinds of people who are interested in radical politics are all hanging out together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Fume is like a big melting pot for all these kinds of things. And it winds up being the place where a lot of what becomes fascism gets cooked up. You know, um, it's like, it's, that's interesting you say it. Cause like, I, I do picture it as like this, like, yeah, like planets form like nebulous balls of gas yeah. where it's like, it's all the same elements and like, you know, you're, it's still like, yeah, all this stuff is still kind of coalescing and stuff like that. And, but I also think this particular moment in history for me is, is it's, it should be very anchoring or, or calibrating for yeah. all of us because what it tells you is that borders are bullshit. Like, yeah, they, yeah. They're not, like it's not real. Borders are real. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like somebody just decided that fumes in Yugoslavia, like you, Yugoslavia came out of this 
plot of land has been here the whole time. All mm-hmm. of a sudden, somebody drew a line around it. You know what I'm saying? So, I, and like, like a large chunk of the city's population are Italian. Like, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, they just woke up in another yeah. country. You know what I'm saying? So, like that to me, like I need everybody to remember yeah. that when we're talking about our modern politics. Like the shit came from here, and it's made up. Well, and when we're yeah. talking about why so many people, because one of the things you see in this period is a lot of people who were anarchists become fascists and a lot of fascists become anarchists. And it's because, yeah. in part because when you when you live through a thing where suddenly tens of millions of people wake up one day in a completely different country than they went yeah. to sleep in, yeah. everything's more malleable, right? Everything's yes. more malleable. And it's not obviously like fascism and anarchism are not similar ideologies, but people who are into both may be drawn to certain similar things. For example, a major aspect of fascism is the cult of action for action's sake, Uh the beauty of violence and physical exertion and speed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of anarchists were also into direct action, physical violence, fighting. Like, and so if you've got communities that are kind of embracing this idea of action for action's sake. Some of them are anarchists, some of them are fascists, but a lot of times they're going to wind up at the same fucking places, you know, which is kind of, you also, if you look at Germany prior to Hitler's rise to power, there were times when the communists and the fascists fought alongside each other against the cops. Mm -hmm. It happened. It's a thing that occurred. Just this understanding that like whatever we have right now isn't working. Exactly. So, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so you're all going to be in the same space. You know yeah. And a lot of people in Fume, they're not, they maybe have called themselves a fascist or an anarchist at the time or a communist. Yeah. It wasn't really settled in their minds. They just yeah. knew that what they had grown up with was wrong, you yes. know? Yes. Um, and yeah, so Fume is one of the things that comes out of this experiment in Fume is the Italian fascist movement gets like solidified in a lot of ways. But it it mm-hmm. starts before like there's thinkers pushing it before then. And while D'Annunzio is off on his adventure in Fume, um, Benito Mussolini forms a fascist party in March 23rd of 1919. Now, a lot of the impetus behind the early fascists uh, in Italy were demilitarized militarized army veterans and particularly special forces guys. Um, uh, most of the fighters who accompanied Denunzio to fume were members of the Arditi, which is like the Italian equivalent of like special forces guys. Like they okay. were very elite soldiers. Mussolini had served in an elite unit of marksmen. Um, there were a bunch of like the, Ar- the guys who followed Denunzio, the Arditi were like trench s- s- like stormers. They were do like what the German stormtroopers would do. Um, and they were terrifying people. They would go into battle with like knives in their teeth and grenades Ooh. in both hands, like running directly ahead of artillery barrages. And like, th- this is where like a lot of that cult of action for action yeah. sake. These are adrenaline junkies. That's a huge uh-huh. part of early fascists in Italy and Germany. These are guys who became ad- addicted to adrenaline during the war and mm-hmm. can't stop fighting when they get back home. And it's a thing that is a factor in our modern fascist movements, right? Clearly. A lot of yeah. a lot of vets and cops and stuff wind up in that. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested in just the whenever somebody says, oh, they started a political party, I'm like, logistically, what does that look? Was there like paperwork you file? Like, how do you start? Like, I still think like, yeah, we'll, we'll start a party. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. I, okay, I want to cool. talk a little bit more about some of these demilitarized vets. Yeah. There's a form online somewhere. Yeah, yeah. The Arditi had been formed in June of 1917 um, as a special forces unit in Italy. Um, and they were like, when they were like sort of... um like knew one of their commanding officers addressed the unit, these very young men, most of whom came from a peasant background who had gotten to be very good at fighting, extremely experienced veterans. And he tells his soldiers, you are the first, the best, the future owners of Italy, the new Italian generation, Ooh. fearless and brilliant. You will prepare the great future of Italy. The smile of the beautiful Italian woman is your reward. God, you and, can't tell, you can't tell no little like young, hungry, no. violent dude that. No, exactly. Right. Like you see the seeds of this, like why so many of these guys become fascists. And as an aside, one of the emblems on their uniform that they wore on their hats was a skull and crossbones, which Mm. is the same basic emblem that the Nazi SS, which started as like Nazi street fighters before they were a military unit, you know what they wore. Right. Like Mm. a lot of the same shit's happening. These guys, the Arditi are famous for giving the stiff armed Roman salute, the Sig Heil, as most people know it. Um, 
Like, so a lot of this stuff, again, you see it all cooking up in World War I. Yeah. And by the time the war came to an end, the liberal political elite in Italy knew that these young guys were terrifying. That like, oh shit, we trained up an entire generation of incredibly violent, incompetent at violence young men, wow. and now we have nothing for them to do. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> and um that they realize this is a problem they disband the arditi like immediately after the war ends it takes less than a month but these guys are still all out there and they have no plan for demilitarizing them and i, I, yeah. I could again make some comments about what happened in iraq after we dissolved the entire no. iraqi army yes <laughs> i was gonna say i'm like we living in that now mm -hmm. <laughs> It's never a good idea. You have ever. to take care of these people afterwards. Otherwise, no. they murder people in the streets sometime um, yeah. or become the nexus of a fascist political party. <laughs> um, so again, Stop four one. months after Stop. the armistice ended World War I, three months after the Arditi are disbanded, on March 23rd, 1919, Benito Mussolini puts together a group of 100 angry young men, a mix of Italian war veterans, a lot of them special forces type guys, former mm. socialist elected leaders and journalists. They meet in Milan and they declare the formation of the fascist party. So Sheesh. that's how it happens. You get 100 dudes wow. together and you're like, we're a fucking political party now. Start recruiting. Yeah. And one of Benito's first moves is to start recruiting from the disaffected ranks of former soldiers. He brings in hundreds of these guys and he reorganizes them into paramilitary squads. Uniformed in black shirts and red fez caps, Mussolini's black shirts start going after their political opponents in the street. Now, in Yo. night. Yeah, find, that's just like yeah. the formula, doc. Find somebody angry and give them a uniform. Give them a uniform. <laughs> tell them it's okay to go out and beat the shit out of people yeah. they already don't like. Yeah, and I'm already angry. I'm yeah. already pissy. And you say those, those, those dudes are your problem. Mm -hmm. And there's, in any society that has just gone through a war and is dealing with economic inequality, which Italy is at this period, yes. an economic collapse and incompetent political leadership, you will be able to find tens, sorry, you will be able to find tens of thousands of those young men who are like, yeah, yeah I'll make this my whole life. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll wear right? whatever Fred let's Perry go. shirts. Fuck it. Let's do it. Yeah. I'll storm the Capitol. Like, <laughs> <Totally>. yes, <laughs> it's very yeah. easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so, Mussolini forms the fascist party. He starts organizing all these squads of black shirts. And for an idea of how fast this gets out of hand, in 1919, Mussolini starts the fascist party with 100 men. By 1921, there were 300,000 members. Sheesh. Woo. Yeah. So I'm going to pause here for another little rant about modern anti-fascism, because this is something that's also relevant to us. Yes. Over the last four years, since Antifa became a household name after the first Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, liberal celebrities and politicians have repeatedly urged people not to confront fascists in the streets. Some have even complained about doxing, which is the public naming and shaming yeah. of fascist activists who are caught in the wild doing Nazi stuff. Now, the general argument tended to go something like this. People showing up to fight them just emboldens them and brings more of them out. Ignore them and they'll go away. This was more or less the attitude of most, but not all, American liberals throughout much of the Trump administration. Yeah. Antifa tended to be condemned as often as groups like the Proud Boys. Police were given a free hand to use violence on anti-fascists, while fascist street movements were ignored or directly enabled by law enforcement and by political parties, well, a political party. Yeah. These organizations, as a result, grew steadily in power and reach for several years. Now, on January 2nd, 2021, liberal activist Amy Siskind tweeted, if you live in D.C., stay off the streets on January 6th. Let the D.C. police take care of the white supremacists like they did in Oregon yesterday. I actually think it will be fun to watch, LOL. Woo! LOL. Yeah. <laughs> Not a take that aged well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Woo! Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, when anti-fascists say fascist movements have to be confronted immediately and often with physical force, they're not always, at least, using bluster or bravado. They're certainly yeah. adrenaline junkies within the totally. ranks of I've no met a few of those people. Absolutely. But that's not entirely or even mostly what that is. It is, in fact, a calculation based on a century of documented history. Yeah. Um, again, from... A hundred to three hundred thousand in about two and a half years. Yeah. C wow. Because ain't nobody yeah. say nothing. Yeah. Because ain't yeah. No, or not enough was said. Or, or not enough yeah. was said. It's it's yeah. It's crazy when yeah. you're dealing with like you, when you like I said you already angry. Yeah. You're already like all you understand is might. And you, it's like you can't reason with somebody that only understand might. 
Yes. And, but then if I go meet you with might and I don't beat you, yeah, then I we all wasted our time and it, and you you feel vindicated because I wasn't able to stop you. It's just yeah, this the the whole the whole concept just puts everybody in a pickle. It's not an easy thing to solve. Yeah, you can't solve it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I'd like, I mean. The best solution is to oppose them with overwhelming numbers because that actually yeah. drastically diminishes the amount of violence that there will be. If you, because yeah. none, none of these guys want to get into a fight if they're outnumbered 300 to one. Yeah. That's not when the violence happens. It's when yeah. they have the numbers or there's parity of numbers, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why people were saying, like, what if tens of thousands of people had showed up in the streets of D.C. to protest? I don't think they would have made it through the Capitol barricades. Now, it's a pandemic. None of this is a simple situation. And it wasn't simple in Italy. And we'll talk, we're going to talk now about the anti-fascist resistance in Italy. Because in Italian, like, Italian fascism did face substantial resistance from anarchists and other anti-fascists. And we're about to talk about why that didn't wind up working out. Much of the anti-fascist resistance in Italy also came from members of the Arditi, from other, like, Hmm. uh, elite soldiers who just like weren't Nazis, right? Yeah. Who like hadn't been, or fascists who yeah. hadn't been pushed right, who'd gone left instead, or who just didn't, you know, still believed in the idea of democracy. Yeah. Because again, anti-fascists in Italy, there's a mix of like the hard left, but also just like people who are Republican, right? And yeah, I mean yeah, that yeah, in yeah. like the sense of, I support a Republican form of government. Yeah. Not like our Yeah, not like a modern Republican. That's yeah. totally, totally different. Yeah. So the inciting incident for the violence between anti-fascists and fascists in Italy is generally seen to ha- uh, as having been an attack Mussolini ordered on April 15th, 1919 against the newspaper he used to write for, Avanti, which was the Socialist Party yeah. newspaper. Um, now, Italian fascists were courageous and often well-organized, but they had to contend with not just fascists, but the police and the army. This meant that the deck was stacked against them from the beginning. Meanwhile, events in Fume caused Mussolini to realize that he had an advantage in the fact that the police and the army were inherently sympathetic to fascists. So again, mm-hmm. we talked about Denunzio's occupation of Fume um, in another episode, but I, a brief refresher here is worthwhile. In short, uh, he occupies Fume for about 15 months. Um, there's mm-hmm. all sorts of art and weird sex and, and you know, yeah, political churning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, things go a little wild. And yeah. eventually the king of Italy like is forced to do something. So King yeah. Victor Emmanuel III, whose nickname was Little Sword because he's a tiny guy. Um, At least he... Poor guy, dude. <laughs> yeah, of all things to be called. I know, right? Just little that a great little nickname. sword, bro. Little sword. Dang. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, you know, I mean, they're Italians. You know what they're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, like, that's called it. You can't be the king yeah. and called little sword. You no. got to like, dang, that's he, He's not a very good king. <laughs> no. So um, he's very sympathetic to what Denunzio is doing. He wants Italy to control fume, right? So he yeah. thinks that Denunzio and his proto fascists are in the right, but also. Fume went to Yugoslavia by international treaty, and he's not about to go to war with the rest of Europe over a no. city of 60,000 people. So he has to send in the army and navy to clear Denunzio out in December of 1920. Now, after this, Denunzio's spell over the Arditi and the other really hardened war veterans who had like gone to him en masse, uh-huh. like, his spell over them is broken, and they switch their allegiance to Mussolini. So these guys, mm. the best fighters, like Mussolini's yeah. early guys aren't really as competent. The people yeah. who had taken Fume, who were like really actually hard and dedicated um, to fucking shit up. Like, those people start swarming over to Mussolini in mass after December of 1920, and they expand the ranks of the black shirts significantly. Um, And Mussolini doesn't just benefit in that way. He also takes a really important lesson away from what happens in Fume. And I'm going to read a quote from the Warfare History Network, who did a great write-up on all of this. This is them describing what Mussolini learns from this occupation. The police would often overlook fascist depredations in favor of attacking their traditional leftist enemies, the socialists. The police would also fire on opponents of the monarchy. More importantly, the Duce observed, which is Mussolini's nickname, so would the military. Therefore, he realized he had to win over the king, the police, and the armed forces by a clever mix of both public bluster and behind-the-scenes old-fashioned political maneuvering to attain appointed or elective office by legal means. In other words, Denunzio, he realizes Denunzio is able to get this far and occupy the Uh city because the army wasn't willing to fight him. The police weren't willing to stop him while he was marching there because they're sympathetic. But when 
D'Annunzio put himself in opposition to the Italian crown and the will of the government. Mm. The police and the army cracked down. They did their duty because they're loyal to the state inherently. Yeah. So if he's going to win, he can't be fighting them. And yeah. he can make use of the fact that they're sympathetic if he just becomes part of the government. That's the way Mussolini realizes fascism is not going to win by a revolution. Fascism is going to win by democratic means because the deck is stacked in our favor if we try it that way. If we try yeah. to like lead a violent revolution, they'll murder us like they would anyone trying to lead a violent yeah. revolution. If we become part of the government, they'll help us crush our enemies and we'll gain power. Dude, The yeah, the finessing because it's – yeah, it's – when you lay it out, it's pretty logical. Mm -hmm. You know, like, a, yeah, a, a monarch, we're talking about something that's lasted thousands. It's, it's, it's in their DNA, dog. Like, mm -hmm. you can't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, it's too, it's like, it's too much to ask. Yeah. You know what yeah, I'm saying? It's, it's too much to ask of these people to try to, like, go against their very nature to be like, but if you, if you include the crown. Yeah. Oh no, you can you keep like, your king. We're just going to yeah. get rid of the left. You yeah. don't like them anyway, do you? Help us yeah. kill them. Like, yeah. yeah. You know Congrats, I mean? you're a fascist win. now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's very savvy. And this is again why I think people yeah. need to have more of the kind of like respect for Mussolini as opposed to seeing him as this buffoon is he's, so he's the first finesser. guy. He, he figures it out. He figures yeah. out how fascists are going to win. Anyway, so Mussolini decides, okay, I have to, um, I can't do what the anarchists and the communists and the left do and try yeah. to like overthrow the government. That's not going to work. My path to victory is going to be finding a way into the government. And this was not yeah. hard for him to do. Uh, he runs for office. And in May of 1921, he's elected to the Chamber of Deputies in Rome, along with 34 other fascist party members. That is quick. Very quick, and they're kind quick. of in the middle of the pack in terms of how many elected leaders they yeah. have. Um, but they're they're in the government now. And Mussolini barely ever showed up in chamber because he thought any governing body based around him compromising was dumb and not worth listening to. But Sheesh. he liked the legitimacy that elected office gave him and his party. And it's not a coincidence that 1921 is also the year when the Royal Italian Army joined the police in cracking down on anti-fascists because mm. now the fascists are part of the government, right? Oh, so we man. can, yeah. Now Here we are, guys. Becoming an elected leader also gave Mussolini immunity from prosecution while he was in office. This was helpful because, while the fascist party gained electoral power, Mussolini's black shirts were increasingly committing murder. And I'm going to quote now from a study in the Journal of Values-Based Leadership. Fascists agitated against the left in streets and neighborhoods across Italy. Socialist offices, institutions, and party newspaper headquarters were attacked and burned. Militias organized throughout the country in anti-Bolshevik crusades, breaking up strikes and fighting labor unions and farmer co-ops. The fascist squads, dressed in black shirts and uniforms, were supported by the local police, landowners, merchants, and industrialists. They used violence to destroy any organization they felt could be in opposition to the doctrine of fascism. Thousands of people were beaten, killed, or forced to drink cast oil and run out of town. Hundreds Ooh. of union offices, employment centers, and party newspapers were looted or burnt down. In October of 1920, after the election of a left administration in Bologna, fascists invaded the council chamber, causing mayhem and nine deaths. The council was suspended by the government. Later, so again, a, a left-wing administration is elected in this city. Fascists invade the council and kill nine people, and it's suspended by the government. God Later, God. socialists and Catholic deputies were run out of parliament or had their houses destroyed. The two black years, 1921 to 1922, destroyed opposition to the fascists. Union organizations were crushed. The Fedetera, Farmers Co-op, shrank from some one million members to less than 6,000 in less than five years. Unable to defend basic democratic rights or prevent the criminal activities of a private militia that operated openly and nationwide, the state had lost all credibility. Yo. Gang banging. Any of that when, sound familiar? Yes, it does. <laughs> it's yes, it's like uh yeah. god dog. Like you it's something it's something that fascinated me as you was reading this is like really helping you get into the brain of like a fascist to where it's like the government's not the head but an appendage. Yeah. Like you're just you're a you're an you're a tool that I wield just like the population, the labor unions, the military, the street guys. They're all just they're all just appendages. These are arms, they're tentacles, but you're means to an end. So I'm getting into the government, not because I feel like 
that means I made it. It's just, no, I just need to wield the government. Yeah. Or my, and that like, to me, that's like a, you just like, oh, it's like your relationship is transactional. Like it's yeah. a functional. This isn't the goal. I just need that. You're my sword. And I'm like, yes, oh, yes, exactly. The government's exactly. just a sword. Yeah. Yeah. This is my weapon that I use on you. It's yes. not a, it's not a list of, as I think a lot of liberals see it. It's not a, a series of obligations. It's not a social no. contract. It's a gun. It's a gun. Yeah. It's a gun. And when you, yeah, yeah that's crazy. They listen, mm -hmm. these, <laughs> these, these so, gangsters, y'all. Anyway. Everything we just read that the black shirts did has been the goal for years of the American fascist movement, not just of mm -hmm. groups like the Proud Boys, but of more extreme and explicitly Nazi organizations. Um, you can see evidence of this in attempted actions of men like Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Hassan, who was caught with an arsenal and a list of Democratic lawmakers he planned to murder. Um, this is very much what groups like the Proud Boys wanted to do to left-wing organizations nationwide. It's why yeah. you saw so many groups of right-wing counter-protesters and militias show up at BLM rallies. Right. Yeah. It's why yeah. before 2020, they were showing up at left wing anti fascist events. It's what you yeah. saw during the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Leftists surrounded and assaulted in mass for standing against fascists. One of the great successes of the anti-fascist movement in the United States that was not uh, something that we saw in Italy has been the fact that they actually did succeed in the widespread disruption of particularly the leadership cast of different fascist organizations. Yeah. Basically, everyone involved in planning Unite the Right had their life ruined, and most yes. of them are no longer relevant on the streets. Nobody talks about Jason Kessler anymore. Nobody yeah. talks all that much about Richard Spencer anymore. Yeah. Um, some of them are in jail, like uh, uh, uh Fuck, what's that guy's name? Uh, the crying knot. Chris Cantwell. That's, um, that's home, that was homie that got kicked off a of Tinder. Yeah, yeah. That I think that happened to him too. Um, and you know, Sorry, a lot of them funny. like Richard Spencer's drowning in legal fees from lawsuits yeah. from people. And and um, yeah, in 2018, not just angry at court cases, but angry at the fact that his speeches were continuously disrupted by anti-fascist activists. Richard yeah. Spencer complained that giving these speech, like having these gatherings, was no longer fun. And quote, Antifa is winning. Um, now he wasn't precisely right about that because January sixth. Yeah showed that the fight is very far from one. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. Spencer was beaten. And most of the original wave of fascist leaders, the people who wanted to do mm -hmm. what Mussolini did, whose goal yeah. was to do what Mussolini did, guys like Spencer, they've been fucking sidelined, which means yeah. that most of the people who are prominent now have not been prominent and in a position of leadership for all that long. So while you have groups like the Proud Boys that have been around this whole time, militias that go back quite a while and more extreme groups that go back quite a while, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the leaders have been disrupted one way or the other, have had their lives yeah. fucked up. And it's stopped them from doing in some ways what maybe they might have otherwise done. It stopped them from gaining as much power. It stopped yeah. their organizations from being as cohesive. Um, some organizations have been shut down, like Identity Europa. Um, so – it's this has been if we want to look at like successes of a modern yeah. anti-fascist movement, that's been one of them. And I think we can credit that for the fact that the attack on the Capitol on the 6th was not better organized or more cohesive because no. there has been disruption of these movements. Do you um, wanna know, I, I, we want to know what else would be a disruption of our our movements right now, Robert. That is was going horrible. to an ad break. Capitalism. I, I really did. Because that is going to disrupt my train of thought significantly. Yeah, I don't like yeah. that. I decided to do that, but. America. It happened. I'm going to eat a chip. That's a good call. Everybody eat a chip. We're back. So, oh, Prop, I think you had you had something on your mind before we... Uh, God uh, damn it. What the hell was I going to say? Went Thanks, out to ad break and you ate a I chip. Was like... What was I going to say? Um, oh, um, there's something that I think the these all school fascists did all school wow um yeah. that these new guys haven't done yeah and I think that's I, I it's it's one of those things it's a fine it's a fine um distinction because at the, I do think there's a lot of value in showing these people as as absurd and as sad as they are um, you have to do it without also making them feel like they're not a threat, which is hard. Yes. You know, that's a, that's uh -huh. a, 
And and thankfully, I think one of the positives of how bad everything went on the 6th is that as absurd as it is, you know, one of the difficulties about talking about this movement to people for a while has been that like folks um, – we're like, okay, well, these are just a bunch of, of kooks on the internet yeah. wearing dumb like, t-shirts about Q. Like, yeah. we, why should I take this seriously? Like, that's why you should take it seriously. Dude, because what they, they did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You just, yeah, it's something again, like. They're dangerous. Yes. Yes. When you, when you, when you, that's why I said it earlier. It's like somebody hungry and angry. Like you, if somebody tell you they willing to die, believe them. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like you, I, you, you should believe them. You take, you underestimate. That's something you learn living in just the inner city. You don't underestimate anybody. Like mm-hmm. if, if you know, if they presented it to you, like I just, I don't know how hungry you are. I might look like your lunch. Now, if I could overpower you, or is a whole other scenario. But you're right. Like I'm not gonna underestimate you, and I really feel like, you know, fast forwarding or yeah, bringing us back to now is that I'm not sure, you know, oh. Oh, 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 Joe Biden really understand how serious your situation is. I, I don't think he does. They, um, they was going to kill you because like, yeah. I don't think you understand. They That man, somebody coming to a Capitol building with a Viking horn. That man don't care about his life. He going to kill you. Yeah. Exactly. And I, yeah. I think, I don't know, that is, again, one of the problems is I think a lot more people are taking it seriously, but I don't think Joe Biden is. I don't, um, think, he's, I don't think you, I don't think you understand, bro. Like, yeah. yo, don't you understand the severity of the situation? It's not done on the 20th, big dog. Like, we're no. not, we're not done. Yeah, there's yeah. a bunch of people out there who, if they had gotten, who, who if they get their hands on you, will yes. do great harm to you. And they almost did it once in their heads, at least. Uh, you yeah, know, this that's practice I, run, homie. Yeah. So uh, let's anyway. let's talk about we 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 got on a little bit of a tangent there, but yes. I want to talk about the Italian anti-fascist. So we just talked about kind of what I see as one of the big successes of the American yeah. anti-fascist movement. I want to talk about why the Italian anti-fascist movement did not succeed. Um, so the Italian anti-fascists began to raise their own proper army in July of 1921, uh, because again, the fascists had an army. the The black shirts were an army, and it was doing mm-hmm. great damage to not just like anarchists, but to all left wing movements around the country. So they formed their own army, the Arditi del Popolo, uh, like the People's Arditi, I think. Yeah. Um, so again, they're still using that term. A lot of them are veterans, and they were a, a heterogeneous mix of anarchists, syndicalists, socialists, communists, republicans. Republicans and other non-authoritarian ideologies. The Arditi del Popolo were popular among the lower classes, among poor Italians, because they had no party affiliations and they offered protection from the fascists, who were basically yeah. a violent gang. Now, there were other militia-style groups that confronted fascists, including the Arditi Rossi, uh, which was a communist organization, but the local communist party forbade them from allying with the anarchists and the Republicans and the like, because, like, y- you wow. guys aren't our fa- friends either, right? This is, again, you oh. see this happening in Germany. Okay. Now, there were communists who were part of the Arditi del Popolo, but they weren't like party communists, you know? Yeah, yeah, There's yeah, a difference yeah, yeah. between those two things. And communists in this era is used a lot for people who were like very anti-authoritarian. Um, a lot of folks would consider them basically anarchists today and also for people who were like Stalinists, you know? Oh, okay. um, and that they weren't Stalinist yet because it was, you know, 19... I was, yeah, I was like, wait. 21, yeah. but like, yeah, they <laughs> that's where they that's where they're, they were they were headed. I'm with you. Um, yeah, so uh, on July 25th, 1921, the Arditi del Popolo held their first national congress. Uh, one of their leaders, a guy named Argo Secondari, outlined the organization's goals in a speech. And uh, this is uh, uh, Argo here. The Arditi del Popolo's action has to be defensive, but defense means above all to prevent and to render impossible any harm that can be caused by the adversary. The Arditi del Popolo do not carry out punitive expeditions, but perform acts of justice. They do not carry terror into the population, but defend the people and organize their security. That is why the Arditi del Popolo welcome members of various parties and contain representatives of all political beliefs. They do not intend to make politics, but leave this to the already existing parties parties and economic organizations. The Arditi Mm. del Popolo must act like a worker's army and give the proletariat defense and protection. Oh, that's not going to work. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they tried. Um, Now, you want to guess why it didn't work? They had no actual goals. It was just like, we're just... 
They're like, oh, no, there's no platform in my head. I'm like, ain't no platform. You just said yeah. we're going to leave that to the government. Y'all, we just going to make sure it's like, no, fool, the government's compromise anyway tell me the answer that is I'm a great me- that is a great you know that didn't even uh occur but you're you're right like these guys are saying our only goal is to defend you from the fascists but that's not nearly as popular as saying hey here's what we be- we're the fascists here's what we believe here's our platform here's what yeah. we're going to change and we have this army right yeah like, that is that is a very good point like you like you said they're leaving the platform up to the government who is not on their side they, and that's, they are government don't like you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Now, that's not everybody, right? There's a lot of anarchists and stuff who aren't saying, like, I think we should leave it to the government, but they yeah. are saying, like, I'm not going to, I think that fighting fascism with these other people is more important than, you know, pushing my own political yeah. beliefs in this necess- in this area, which is, yeah. I think, a respectable thing to take, but it was a problem that there was not a concerted, organized um counter left wing movement that was like yeah. that that had like a solid platform in the to the extent yeah. that the fascists did right there were different yeah. left wing groups that confronted them and had platforms but it was not like what it was not on the side on the same scale you know yeah and that's a problem that anti-fascists still have today right yeah there's a strength in saying like hey if you're a communist if you're an anarchist if you're uh uh just a libertarian who's not an authoritarian if you're a democrat like come join us we're just trying to fight the fascists but there's a weakness in well but also we don't agree on anything other than that totally. right like yeah, yeah. and then it's like okay cool so what if you win yeah what do we do yeah. after that? Well, or how do you win if yeah. they have a thing they believe that they're fighting for and you're mainly yeah. fighting against them? That That is true. There's a good point yeah. to that. Um, and there's obviously there's a lot of anti-fascists who do, who wrap their anti-fascism in um, this is part of the struggle against capitalism. This is part yeah, of the struggle for a better world. It. This is part of a revolutionary. Okay. That's a lot of it today. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, those people did exist in Italy at the time, but this large organized, the Arditi del Popolo, isn't really doing that. Um, no. And it's it's part of their downfall, I guess, mm-hmm. um, because the government starts spying on them, as is always the case whenever <laughs> leftists organize in any government. Y'all. Yeah. Government undefeated, boy. <laughs> yeah, and the in Italy's FBI equivalent actually did confirm in a report to the government that the Arditi del Popolo had, quote, only one principal aim, that is to react against fascism with the same means that are employed against them, i.e. armed defense. So mm-hmm. the the Italy's like FBI equivalent is like, these guys are only there to for defense defensive purposes. But despite this, the government orders a crackdown on the Arditi del Popolo. They enforce yeah, anti-paramilitary laws against them. They dissolve local cells. They imprison many leaders and members. And by October, the organization is essentially defunct. Now, no such actions were taken against the black shirts. And as a result, by the end of 1921, Mussolini's fascist party had more than a quarter of a million members or like 300,000 members, something yeah, like bro. that. Um, this is so one again, of those situations where like, yeah, your your house is getting broken into and you call the police and the police arrest you. And yeah. You're like, fam, this is my house. Like, I'm telling you, I'm not the problem. I don't yep. understand this. I, I'm telling you, this is the issue. And they're like, we're going to book them, Dano. It's like, mm-hmm. oh man. Like, I feel like, I don't know. That's what it sounded like to me. I'm like, you yep. infiltrating the wrong hood right now. Yeah, the the police crack down pre and the army crack down exclusively on the anti fascists, yeah. and the fascists are allowed to continue to organize. And they say like they use the same laws against them they could have used on the fascists for having the black shirts. They just don't choose. They and choose not. Especially and the part that don't make sense and continues to not make sense is like you said, the fascists are telling you they platform. Mm-hmm. This is our plan. We finna overthrow you. Mm-hmm. And put all our guys in power, and that's our dude. That's our plan. Mm-hmm. Oh, you on our side? Okay, cool. Like, yeah, well, yeah. It's because they. It's I. You know, it's 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 because hatred of the left unites yeah. the fascists and the people who wouldn't necessarily be whole hogging on fascism, but are because they hate the left. Got it. Which is you know why this this keeps happening and why. Um, yeah, it's 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 frustrating. We deal with versions of the same problem today. And this is why I don't suggest people who are talking about like, well, in the wake of the sixth, we need a new anti-domestic terrorism statutes. Like that's only going to be used on the left. Like they'll yeah. do they'll use it once on a couple of Proud Boys and then it will yeah. be used against leftists for decades. That's the way it's going to happen. And Muslims, you know, anyone who's not a white conservative. Oh, man. So as we know, the problem is white people. Always. Yeah. <laughs> Always. Yeah. Although God in Italy, white people, 
basically everybody's <laughs> white, so up. that's really pretty easy to say. <laughs> now, yeah. Uh, so I'm just by the, kidding. Behind the bastards, listeners. I'm just kidding. I'm much more nuanced than that. I'm not <laughs> kidding. Behind the bastards, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, 1921, end of 1921, early 1922, the anti-fascist resistance has been heavily, like not completely eliminated, but very badly broken. Mm -hmm. Um, The fascists are ascendant. They have hundreds of thousands of members. They have elected leaders in government. Um, Now, again, they're kind of middle rung when it came to their actual number of elected leaders. They're not in charge at all. But Benito didn't care about how many actual elected deputies they said. He famously stated, I prefer 50,000 rifles to 50,000 votes. What mattered Yeesh. to him was having a presence in the halls of power, which would enable him to get those rifles on his side. And of course, the government's already shown that they're going to let him accrue yeah. rifles while they yeah, stop his good. opponents from getting rifles. Yeah. Now, Mussolini starts in 1922 sketching out the dimensions of an ambitious and daring plan for a power grab. He had spent the last year or so placing strategic groups of fascists around the country, replacing shattered left-wing trade unions with their fascist equivalent, which allowed him to organize postal workers, cab drivers, and other working communities. He expanded the black shirts into a force of tens of thousands, a veritable paramilitary army. On October 16, 1922, he convened a meeting in Milan with his most trusted deputies, including the three commanders of the black shirts and two retired Italian army generals. He announced that he was planning to organize a mass march on Rome. He would gather a force of tens of thousands of black shirts and march to occupy the capital and force a change of government. At Mm. this stage, Mussolini did not think that he was going to be the head of that government. Instead, his goal was to force a coalition, a liberal prime minister with five fascist ministers, basically like... um, Uh, cabinet secretaries, kind of, uh, who would be the real power behind the scenes. So he wanted to have a liberal, like, in front and have it all be run by fascists, right? Okay. So the actual inspiration for the March on Rome came not from Mussolini, but from the secretary of the National Fascist Party, Michel Bianchi. Bianchi wanted an armed fascist insurrection to force the liberal ruling class to hand over power to Mussolini himself, rather than even paying lip service to the idea of liberal democracy. And Bianchi eventually like convinced everyone to go with his plan. Now, true to form, Mussolini took credit for it later, claiming that the march, the plan for the March on Rome had come to him after a rally in September when his supporters had chanted, to Rome! to Rome. But in any case, by October of 1922, he's ready to do this shit. So Mussolini gives a speech to about 60,000 of his followers at a fascist Congress in Naples on October 24th, and he tells them, our program is simple. We want to rule Italy. Now, as he spoke on the 24th, units of his black shirts were fanning out to occupy key locations around Italy in preparation Hmm. for this march on Rome. In all, some 26,000 fascist paramilitaries assembled with illegal arms and ammunition. From the Warfare History Network, quote, Illicit stores of arms and ammunition were received secretly from sympathetic police stations and some army barracks, while armories and even museums were raided for antique firearms. The overall array of weaponry included shotguns, muskets, powder-loaded pistols, golf clubs, scythes, garden hose, tree roots, table legs, dynamite sticks, dried salt codfish, and even an ox's jawbone. What? Just whatever they can beat someone with. If they can't get a gun, it's anything they can hit someone with. And imagine an antique weapon already in 1923. You know what I'm saying? That's that's an old gun. That's an old gun, boy. This is so weird. It's just whatever they can get their hands on. So that was, you actually answered one of the questions I had. I was like, so if they're marching to Rome, where are they coming from? So they're coming from everywhere. He's in Naples right now, but they're coming from everywhere. They are coming Um, from everywhere. And they have horses and carts, trucks and wagons. They even have a race car with the machine gun mounted to it. Um, And they have guys riding on trains. That's that's style and finesse. You feel me? Like There's some style in the machine gun race car. That's some style right there. You got to give it to them. Yeah. And a lot of people are just marching on foot, too. Now, obviously, this is a cause for concern for some people in the government. Two days after the Naples speech, former Italian Prime Minister Antonio Salandra becomes aware of Mussolini's plans, and he warns the current Prime Minister that the fascist leader was organizing an armed march on the capital. Salandra's intelligence told him that Mussolini planned to demand the prime minister's resignation and demand that he be appointed head of the government instead. So the prime minister... Obviously, he's also worried by this. He goes to the king with this warning, and he asks the king for permission to use the police and military to suppress the fascists. The king refuses. 
So the hmm. reason the king says no is that he had just sat down with his minister of war, General Armando Diaz. Now, the general, who was not quite – well, who was basically a fascist, tells the king that if he asks the army to stop Mussolini, quote, the army will do its duty, but it would be better not to put it to the test. Basically, he's like, Sheesh. enough of the army likes these guys that you really shouldn't – you really shouldn't Dang. try it. Uh, so King Victor Emmanuel III, the little sword, was not like an ideological <laughs> fascist. Can't. Every time you say it, I know I it's very silly. <gasps> oh man, what if that was his like Tinder profile? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, little little sword. sword. He's not a fascist in the sense that he doesn't believe in fascism. He believes in a monarchy. And more specifically, he believes in a monarchy where he's the monarch. Yeah. Now, by 1922, the Kingdom of Italy is in bad financial straits. Uh, World War I had been a disaster for the country. The great, like, not the Great Depression, but like an economic collapse has hit Europe as a result of the end of the war. It's Mm -hmm. horrible in Munich uh, in this period of time, too, right? Political violence in the streets had reached a fever pitch, largely thanks to Mussolini's black shirts, and the king was afraid there might be a civil war. More than anything, he was worried about the rising Italian left. The Socialist Party had 146 members in the Chamber of Deputies, and the Communists had 11, giving them together nearly five times as much elected representation as the fascists. Now, Communists and Socialists aren't big fans of kings, and Victor Emmanuel crudely calculated the fascists would let him continue to be the king. (laughs) He also, and this is important, calculated that the middle class would back the fascists if it meant crushing the left. And he was right on both counts. Some of the king's generals did push back and demand he sign orders to send the army out after the black shirts. The king threatened to abdicate at this, insinuating that this would put Italy in the same position as Russia had been in when the czar abdicated. Basically, Mm. if you force me to use the army on these fascists, I will leave the throne. And you saw what happened to Russia when the czar left the throne. You don't want those scary Bolsheviks being in charge. Ooh, so let's not the let the fascists in. Come on, man. Yeah. Dang. You, it's like, that's, see, that's what, like, at the end of the day, that's, to me, that's like the problem with, like, when you only understand the world via, like, power broker, brokering and mm-hmm. might, you know, um, like, in my mind, like, I take to, weird comparison but if you take like mike pence's like position right now like with the 25th amendment or president being impeached it's like he if for lack of better term either way he's a bitch because it's like you first of all it's not like it's not like donald trump has ever respected you because you do what the hell he tells you to do you know what i'm saying so it's like this man this man was finna let these they was yelling to kill you and he didn't Mm -hmm. stop it and you ain't do shit, Mike. You ain't do shit. You let this man, and you still gonna back this man. You're a bitch. You understand what I'm saying? The one yeah. time he publicly disagrees with you, and then he calls for your head, and they want to take it, and they yeah. would. And if they got the chance, they would have. Yeah. And you didn't say nothing. You're a bitch. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I mean, I'm saying that tongue. You can understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So it's like you're okay. So then, so then Nancy Pelosi and, and, and with the with the uh, the Democrats with the impeachment being, and so it's almost like them saying, "Yo, get your boy before we do." Right. Yeah. So then, so now, and and then if he doesn't, if he doesn't, if he doesn't stop the impeachment, you're a bitch again. You know what I'm saying? If you don't call for the 25th Amendment, you're a bitch. You feel me? So it's just like, no matter what, the, the, the moral of the story is you should have never signed up to play with this man. You know what I'm saying? So it shouldn't have got here in the first place because all this, all these people understand is power brokering. So when you, so if you King Lil Sword, you feel me? <laughs> you set yourself up to a situation where these people only understand power. Either way, you're a bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I don't, I mean, I'm, I hate saying it like that. I just, because it's like, I'm not trying to like throw shrapnel towards, you know what I'm saying? A derogatory term toward a female. You know what I'm saying? That's not what I'm trying to say, but I am saying just in street terms, that's what we mean. There's, you can't, you've put yourself in a position where you can't leave this unscathed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And it's, yeah, that's kind of where we are here. And so the king and also a lot of liberal elected leaders Mm -hmm. are like, okay, let's like, let's let these people in. Let's let them do it. 
they're not as scary as these leftists. So let's let the fascists into the government. Can you imagine um, being you imagine being a king where it's like my bloodline go back to the fifteen hundreds, and mm-hmm. I'm the one that's about to lose the. I'm not going to lose this crown. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I I get the calculation. It's just you're. It's just you're the you're the punk in this. Yeah, you know you're starting the ball of fascism rolling in Europe. Yeah, because you want to yeah. keep a throne, and because a lot of other elected leaders. So when uh, his so his prime minister resigns when it becomes clear that the king is not going to stop the fascists, yeah. and a bunch of former prime ministers, many of them liberals, start petitioning the king to make them the prime minister again, so that they can make Mussolini their vice minister to placate the fascists. So like again, establishment politicians cannot wait to make a deal with the fascists. Yeah, like. Couldn't do it fast enough. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, the king says no, though, because the king has decided that Mussolini's going to be the new premier, <sighs> right? That he's just going to give him straight to the big job. And yeah. while all this is going on, the black shirts are marching. So years later, Mussolini would claim to have marched on foot with his soldiers all the way to the capital. The reality is that he stayed in Milan for the first day, <laughs> few days of the march. He was seen at the theater two just nights in, in a row. Yeah, <laughs> he's not. I'll stay back here just in case. <laughs> well, it's like how Donald Trump tells his crowd to like march on the Capitol and then goes back home. <laughs> <laughs> behind yeah. bullet- he's like, that's the part. I'm like, do y'all see this man behind bulletproof glass? Yeah. Telling like, no, you they got go guns over there. I'm not doing that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, why you follow this man? Yeah. yeah. Feel like one of you might get shot. Anyway, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm good, though. You see this glass? You, you can't go shoot me. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he stays in Milan. He keeps a getaway car gassed up and ready, prepared to flee to Switzerland. Actually, more ready to flee for Switzerland than he is to actually go to Rome because he's sure they're going to crack down on this. He's just making just a gamble. In case, he doesn't think it's going to work. I uh, got a plan B. <laughs> eventually, though, after several days, he realizes that the king is not going to institute martial law to stop the march and that he'd won. Like, this is Dang. a dawning realization while he's in Milan that, like, oh shit, we're getting away with this. So, <laughs> so that has to be Donald Trump. In he's very there's some similarities where he was like wait what wait what wait what we did so, it yeah. kind of shocked that this had worked Mussolini starts scrambling to dress himself up as the revolutionary leader it now kind of seemed like he was and I'm going to quote now from the warfare historical network Mussolini's own Milan newspaper office where he was staying was barricaded with huge rolls of newsprint paper and barbed wire and guarded by a curious mix of fascist police and army troops. His second floor offices featured hand grenades and desk trays, and the flustered Duce himself was seen brandishing a rifle. Melodramatically, he wrote in his 1928 autobiography, there was a rapid exchange of shots. I had my rifle loaded and went down to defend the doors. Bullets whizzed around my ears. This is all a lie. Uh, The reality is that the Milan police chief refused to even arrest him. The mayor and commander of the Royal Guard asked for a truce with the fascists and withdrew their men from around his office. Um, There was no real crackdown taken on Mussolini directly whatsoever. Now, while his militia marched, they took over telephone switchboards, telegraph offices, waterworks, and other government buildings. Um, Very little resistance to this. About seven black shirts are shot dead by the army in various skirmishes um, during this period of time. And about a dozen people die over the course of the march on Rome. Mussolini gets increasingly confident as phone calls start coming in from the royal palace from the king, but he refuses the first three calls from the king because Mussolini does understand how power works. And he knows that when you got him on the ropes, you want to yeah. bring him a little bit closer, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're yeah, willing yeah. to make a call? I'm not yeah. going to take that first call. No, I'm going to take that second or that I'll third wait. call either. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get him close. Get him close. That's how you do it. Yep. So uh, eventually uh, he decided that his men had occupied enough territory that he felt confident the king was not going to turn around and shoot him as a traitor if he showed up in Rome. So on the night of October 29th, Benito Mussolini took a sleeper train from Milan to Rome. For the soon-to-be dictator, the march on Rome consisted of a single 14-hour train ride. So he does no marching. He takes a train right into the capital while his guys are marching and fighting. (laughs) Um, That's a long walk, bro. No, I'm not marching to Rome. What the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so 20th Benito, century bro I'm not marching <laughs> we got trains <laughs> now Benito would later lie about every major aspect of the march on Rome the reality is that about seven black shirts again were shot and a dozen people died once they were in power the fascists claimed that 3,000 people had been killed in vicious fighting for control of the capital which is again Dang. just a lie to make it seem heroic yeah. When he finally met the king, Mussolini's first words were, Your majesty will forgive my attire. I have come from the battlefield. 
Oh which is again, my God. You came from Milan, dude. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Two points for style, dog. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good line. It was a good, forgive me, I just came from battle. What did yeah. At the buffet line? Uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, where were you fighting? Where was you yeah. battling? I told the army not to fight you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Victor Emmanuel has to have known Mussolini was lying about that, yeah. but he liked Mussolini. He considered him yeah. a, quote, man of purpose, and he appointed him as premier, foreign minister, and interior minister. What? On October 31st, the day after Mussolini's meeting with the king, his black shirts finally arrived in Rome. He had them turn around immediately and march to the train station so they could go home. As the fascist columns withdrew, the king declared, Mussolini has saved the nation. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious! Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me recap that for a second. <laughs> I sent y'all, got what I needed, then I sent you back, are you saying I saved? Oh, I love it. Yeah, that. it's great. It's a great position great. to be in if you're Mussolini. Yes. He's really riding a high right now. Yeah. Um, because a lot of Italians <laughs> agreed that he'd saved the nation because people are really fucking dumb. And How? again, you have to assume very little access to accurate news about what was happening. Where is you know? your antennas? Yeah. Now, the Roman middle class was overjoyed by the lack of violence and by the fact that the dreaded anarchy and the threat of a communist revolution had been avoided. The no, stock sheesh. market rose on news of, of Mussolini's power grab. And I should note here that on January 6th, 2021, the Russell 2000 Index of Small Capitalization stocks rose 3.7%, uh, while the S&P 500 rose 0.6%. Now, this had less to do with the stock market loving the fact that there'd been an attempt to take over the capital and more to do with it loving stability because January 6th ended with everybody repudiating the president and the certainty that there would be a transfer of power. Yeah. And but that's kind of the same reason why the stock markets raised when Mussolini like took power. It's because someone was in power. There was certainty. Right. Yeah. That's That's, I I love that. I love that you brought that up, because mm -hmm. like if you if you want to talk about you know, big corporations, you know, one percenters, high money, they are still beholden to a stable government that will, um, like affirm and support their contracts. Like if I got contracts all over the place and you breach this contract, I want to be able to sue the crap out of you. So I got to take you to a court. That means I have to have a government stable enough that says, so, 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 yeah, so 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 it has no no moral value either way. I just need y'all to chill. And Mm -hmm. if and if and if there's somebody that could stop it, now that y'all agree, I'm uh, cool. I don't care what you agree with. Just as long as y'all agree so that my money can keep coming. So that's that 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 point about the stock market. That's dope, man. That's the type of stuff that like, you know. I always, I always cringe any anytime any leader, I don't care who you are, say, well, the stock market rose this. And it's like, man, what the fuck? That guy ain't got to do nothing. They just want y'all to, you know what I'm saying? Like that's that doesn't, that's not the indicator that you that you say it is. Yep. It's not. Um it's, and it's it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's a sign, it's a sign that the people who are rich are confident they're gonna continue to be rich. Um, this is all it is. This and that's all. that's that's where fascism's power traditionally comes from. And not as much from the rich as it does from the middle class. The yeah. middle class of Italy backed Mussolini for the same reason. It, he meant stability, right? Yeah. Maybe they weren't all fascist. Most of them weren't. Most of them had never really like – hadn't supported the fascists prior to him coming into power. But mm-hmm. now that he was in power, it means the communists aren't going to win. It means I'm not going to lose my business. I'm not going to lose like whatever – like because yeah. I'm in the middle class. I got shit to lose, right? Yeah. Yes. That's what the middle class is. You're the shit to lose class. Yes. Um, now, yeah, the middle class was in Italy, as it has been in every country that's been taken over by fascists, the chief base of fascist support. Yes. Um, and this is true, again, everywhere fascism gains political power. In March of 2016, an NBC survey found that only about a third of Trump supporters in the primaries had a household income at or below the national median income of $50,000 a year. Mm. Um, and that stayed more or less the same for the election. Um, and again, you can look at the same kind of things happened in Germany. Um, yeah, the same, I, it was the same class that supported him. The, the, yeah, like it, it's important and. I, I, again, another thing I love, you just brought up, brought this up too. Cause it's like, when you're talking about somebody that lives below the poverty line, you don't have time 
to be listening to whatever the fuck the, the politicians are saying. Like, I'm trying to secure my next meal. So there's not a, this, they don't, you don't have the luxury to go lobby and, and canvas and do all the things that someone who has, uh, uh, you know, liquid capital, like leisure capital be able to do. So that's the middle class. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, so yeah, it's just, yeah. It's same thing like us critiquing our own silo to be like, man, don't, you can't just call this. You can't just say it was all these poor, these poor white it's people not, that put them in yeah. power because they hungry. They working. Yeah. These poor people working. They ain't got and time for all this. You more than anything, it's the fucking, it, what the fascists are saying to the middle class, to the comfortable, yes. is saying like, you see that poor motherfucker who doesn't have time to think about any of this because he's living yeah. hand to mouth? The communists are going to make that be you, you that know? Be like, you. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that's, the, that's the fucking pitch. Yep. Um, and it works every time, or at least it, it, it works well <laughs> enough that it becomes a problem every yeah. time. Maybe it's yeah. not going to work this time. We'll fucking see. Um, yeah. Cause Trump because Trump was bleeding of, middle class support in 2020. I don't know. We'll see. He really was, man. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. We owe that to Behind the Bastards. Thank you. Yeah, I take total credit um, <laughs> All for Biden's victory. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, fascism generally cloaks itself as a working class movement of laborers and hard men doing hard jobs. It's always the yeah. image, right? The, the, yeah. the imagery of like a guy working at a steel mill or some shit. Yeah. But that's not where their support actually comes no. from. The support of fascism comes from a lot of – like the middle class and the a lot of the affluent. Not all of the affluent because a lot of the very rich are more establishment people. They're not going to mm. back – they'll back a fascist when they're in power because, again, they don't want to lose their shit. Just needs to build. Like, it's all you need. They're, yeah. They're, they're – up until it becomes clear the fascists are going to win they're you know they're going to back whatever the order was previously mm -hmm. the middle class is scared and anxious and always yeah. being pushed from both directions so they're the ones who yeah. really will go with a fascist and the first person in history to really lay this out was luigi salvatorelli now he was an editorial writer for an anti-fascist newspaper named la stampa I'm going to re quote now from an article on the March of Rome by scholar Emilio Gentile talking about Luigi Salvatorelli and how he came to this conclusion. Quote, a year before the March on Rome, Salvatorelli understood that fascism was a new re revolutionary movement and that it organized and mobilized a new social class, the petite bourgeoisie, equally hostile to the proletariat and the upper middle classes. Salvatorelli hmm. had labeled fascism reactionary Bolshevism, a danger today infinitely more real than communist Bolshevism. He had sensed that fascist ambitions went beyond the bourgeoisie anti-proletarian reaction and the protection of the middle class. The dictatorial ambition of fascism, Salvatorelli wrote in December 1921, had already shown its face in parts of Italy, where the fascist party was imposing its dictatorial will by crushing opponents to whom they denied any political or civil right, including the right to live. In July 1922, when not even Mussolini had thought about taking over power, Salvatorelli denounced the ongoing anti-state attack perpetrated by fascism that was endangering the very existence of the Italian state in order to establish a regime of violence throughout the country. Immediately after the March on Rome, Salvatorelli stated that the fascist government was determined to establish a one-sided dictatorship because it did not want any political activity to be carried out outside of fascism. Salvatorelli saw in fascism, as he wrote on November 1st, 1922, the true and proper characteristic of a political movement, of a party organized for its own ends, of a specific social class, and that aimed at the conquest of power on its own, was determined to fling itself against the existing state in the name of the presumed greater good of the nation. Hmm. <sighs> Needed a breath after that one. Yeah, it's a lot there. There's yeah. a lot there. He suggested something that I the thought in that that the thought never crossed my mind yeah. that as there were so many big words it's hard for me to nail down exactly where I heard it but he almost suggested the possibility of a two party system in a fascist state when he was like this fascism impresses it was almost like he it's it sounded redundant where he was kind of like this one party power fascist state as if it's possible to have a two-party system 
in a yeah, fascist. Yeah, well, because that's is what, it? at the time, at the time, fascists were a part of the government, right? And a uh, lot of people, even a lot of like liberals were like, well, it, they're not that dangerous. They're just one other party. They have their view. This is that, that's, it's that old thing of like, well, they have an uh, opinion and everybody gets to have their view and like, we have to listen to them. Yeah. They ha- they get the freedom to speak their piece. Okay. And what Salvatrelli is saying is their piece what they're saying they believe is that only their opinion matters and they'll kill you if you have a different one. Got it. So we he's can't like, let them in the government. Got yeah. it. So he's trying to say, are y'all yeah. hearing what he's saying? Yeah. Y'all really, did you hear what he just said? Like, this is oh, not I just like y'all another hear party. What he just said. Yeah. Yeah. If we okay. let them, they will be the only party, right? Got it. Um, okay. And he's, and he's also saying like they are, their strength comes from a class Right. And yeah. because the um, a lot of the communists at the time had been like had written off the fascists as any kind of real movement and had even written off yeah. the March on Rome. We'll talk about that later in the series. We're going to do a big okay. episode at the end on sort of what we can learn from all this. But mm-hmm. there was a, a big failure among a lot of people in the left and even anti-fascists to see fascists as the threat that they really were, because, number one, they were so darn silly. But number two, like, yeah. well, you know, I'm looking at this from this Marxist analysis, and it tells me that all these classes like it it, 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 it mm. informs it. I don't I don't see this as a legitimate political movement that is speaking to a class that has a large body of the populace behind it. Yeah, um, so, okay, that was the piece I was missing when yeah. you add the Marxist, like, glasses on there and you go, yeah. oh, well, yeah. well, who's, well, where do they fit? Like, where's yeah. the, co- this can't be real because they don't fit in none of these... I yeah, and there's there's this attitude, again, we'll talk about this later, among a lot of Marxists that like, well, fascism is just the inevitable in state of capitalism. And one of the things Salvatorelli is saying, and a lot of thinkers say is like, that's not exactly true. Fascism mm-hmm. is pro-capitalism a lot of the time. It's also anti-capitalism a decent chunk of the time. And that's how it gets a lot of people on board with it. Yeah. Um, it's it's it is speaking to a specific class in the country who feels edged out by both sides, who feels oppressed by the rich and who feels that the left is coming for what little they do have, right? That's who gets on board with this shit. And you have to see that they are looking out for their own, that that, that they have like interests that they see being threatened. Like that this is not just some sort of like plot by the bankers to take power for themselves, right? The, the, The fascists are speaking to legitimate um, you know, even if they're wrong, legitimately felt. A belief, exactly. Like, those, those, like, those are like legitimate. Threats. Yeah. Those are legitimate emotions that, that yes. you are actually in your body experiencing, whether mm-hmm. that's the reality. Like oh, I say that about like, yeah. um, there's this, this, you know, this discussion about like, well, you know, race is a social construct. Therefore it's not real. Therefore racism is not real. And I'm like, okay, yes, you're right. Race is a social construct, but what I'm experiencing in my body is real it's mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying so i i love it i love that because it's like i yeah. that's that's what you can't dismiss about these people that are so riled up that they would storm a capital it's, it's that what they're experiencing in their bodies is exactly what you said is mm-hmm. being is is you're pressed on both sides and, and yeah you from, feel from that way at least you feel it at least yeah and this person is saying yeah these group of people are saying i feel you yeah. And I have an answer for you. Yeah. And I have an answer for you. And it's let's kill the left and take over the government, you know, easy. like, yeah, easy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, the sixth happened. Um, yeah. So Mussolini uh, uh, takes office um, so two weeks after the march the, uh, on Rome on November. Comes back from the buffet. Come back yeah, from the buffet. Back from war, the buffet ready to leave. Marriott. Yeah. Uh, he's ready to leave. November 16th, 1922, he stands before the Chamber of Deputies to present his new list of ministers. So he picks out all the people who are going to run the government, all fascists. Um, Now, the new prime minister, uh, Mussolini, begins his speech to the Chamber of Deputies by attacking the nation's elected leaders, calling them old and deaf and incompetent. And he even (laughs) threatened them with violence, stating, with 300,000 armed men determined to carry out my orders, I could have punished those who have vilified and tarnished fascism. I could make this deaf and gray hall filled exclusively with fascists. I could, but I have not, at least not for now. <laughs> he said, he said, shut up. Mm-hmm. Shut up, Gramps. I'll slap the shit out of you. Now, he promised his assembled deputies that his new fascist Italy would ensure law and order, strengthen the military, and crush the left. The next day, the Chamber of Deputies conducted a vote of confidence, which Mussolini won 306 to 116. So again, he he says, like, I can fucking kill you if I want to. Yeah. And they're like, yeah! <laughs> the, 
thumb up. I'm, I'm putting yes. I yeah. I a voting I for you. May now, just threaten your life. Yeah. I'm gonna read a quote from an article by Emilio Gentile uh, about. Um, anti-fascism in Italy and about the March on Rome. Quote, Benito Mussolini could now claim that power was bestowed on him by democratic means, even though it was claimed that many votes were cast out of terror and intimidation from the fascists, which he had literally threatened the yes, entire I, chamber. Benito, <laughs> Benito was the man of the hour. He was in fact eminently a product of a particular crisis, World War I, and a special social class, the petty bourgeoisie. Mussolini's capture of power was classic. He was the right national leader, at the right moment. Okay. By 1923, Mussolini's consolidation of power was complete. Italy was a fascist state, and any resistance to the regime from then on would take the form of mere insurgency. In total, between 1918 and 1923, Italian anti-fascists killed some 428 fascists. Meanwhile, Mussolini's blackshirts murdered at least 3,000 people in the same period. Most of those people were not anti-fascists. They were members of trade unions, journalists, local politicians, anyone who stood in the way between fascists and ultimate power. And again, we've talked a bit about why the Italian anti-fascists didn't succeed, and that's a longer conversation than we can have mm -hmm. today. I think you're right that a lack of a, a lack of something with momentum to oppose fascism, true momentum, was a part of it. Yeah. Um, a lack of uh, state support is another part of it. There's a thing that some folks on the kind of who are are. Um, anti-fascist and anarchist activists in particular will talk about called the three-way fight, which is the okay. idea that we're not just fighting against the fascists, we're fighting against the state and we're fighting against the fascists because the state mm -hmm. is also deeply harmful and deeply injurious yes. to life. And you, that was particularly very strongly felt by people during uh, the BLM uh, yeah. uprisings of 2020, right? Like yeah. we have these fascists, these proud boys and stuff coming in the street to do violence to us. We also have the cops doing it. We're in a three-way yeah. fight, right? Very yeah. valid way to look at things. It's also an almost impossible situation to win because the fascists aren't in a three-way fight. The fascists, no. if they're smart, they're not. Dumb fascists yes. sometimes are. Yes. Um, and maybe our fascists have taken a turn for the dumb, let's hope. But <laughs> the smart fascists get to power with some degree of legitimacy and legality and then yeah. use the state to crush their enemies because they yeah. don't want a three-way fight, right? And that's yeah. a problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because yeah, because yeah, because the government's just a weapon. It's not yeah, because the government's it's not the just end goal. a weapon. It's just a yeah. weapon. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Sheesh, man. I need a shower. Yeah. Oh God. Please tell me you're done. Yeah, no, I'm done. That's the end of episode <laughs> one. Oh, oh Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Dog, it's like the, it just, the part of you that feels like these people give you this, when you're trying to, to stop, when you're the ones trying to stop an insurrection, it's like these people give you no, you have no safe haven. They give you no breaks. Like they, you can never stop and take a breath because they going to read that as weakness. And then next thing you know, somebody tying up Nancy Pelosi. And it's not mm -hmm. that I'm a Nancy Pelosi fan. It's just, you shouldn't be able to tie Nancy Pelosi up. You know yeah, what I'm that's saying? That's not like, how that should happen. That's not how it should happen. You feel me? Like I just, this, and it's not that I'm a fan of the U S government. However, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> however, yeah. there are worse things to live there under. There are worse things. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> so it's just like, there's, yeah, like you said, like you feel like you're in a three-way fight. And my fight is, is especially as, as someone who, would say organizationally and factually my black life matters right is that that's all i'm trying to say is nigga can i live like god damn it man can i live you know and, and so you you the, my goals i feel like in a lot of ways if it comes to like how do i say this like i'm not looking for as a as a black person, if you will, I'm not I'm just looking for my rights to be honored. Yeah, that's all I'm trying to say. Just honor my rights. Like I have no there's no platform of a reconstruction of the government short of just stop fucking killing. Like, let me just yeah. be a citizen like you, dog. Like, that's all. Can you just let me be a citizen like you, bro? Like, that's all I'm saying. So so when you when you try to when you pit me against a fascist movement that's saying, well, no, our goal is to overthrow this whole thing and be in charge. And no, you don't get rights. 
and somehow the government choosing you, it's like, it's hard. It's almost like all I, all I get to do now is, I got homeboys that live in Atlanta. And what they saying is they finna just grab their popcorn and watch the civil war between these fascists and the, and the police. Like, I'm just going, cause it's like, I don't, I want to be on the side of the government, but the government on the side of me either. You know what I'm saying? Yep, so it's yep. just, you just in this weird predicament, but I well, know who I don't want to win. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I, it, yeah. this is where we get to the problem of the side opposing the fascists has done a lot of good. Uh, and it is important to oppose fascists. What's actually needed to beat them. Opposing them yes. is one thing and it can slow them down. What's needed to beat them is to provide something else that is not the state as it exists because that's yes. not working. Yes. Um, but that you can also get people on enough people on board with the fascists don't have oxygen anymore, right? Yeah. The fascists, it, it's like a fire, right? Where you've got uh -huh. a bunch of dry fucking brush and trees yes. and shit and oxygen. And as long as you have those things, the fire is going to spread. And the way to counter that is to fucking pour some fucking water on it, you know? Um, you no, need it's, to a good, reduce, it's a good example. That's a good yeah, analogy, man. Yeah. You need to reduce the area in which it can spread and it's human terrain, right? Yeah. So by, the only way to reduce the it's human good. terrain the shit can spread in is to give people something else. Yes, yes. Because they don't have anything right yes, now. Yes, that's what I was going back to when you was yeah. asking me like, why did this fail? I was like, they didn't give them nothing else. Yeah. It just said, don't yeah. do this. Well then, well, what do we do? Because this shit yeah. that we got now ain't working. Yeah, so, it's either yeah. the government that led us into World War I uh, or some people who are saying we should do what they're doing in Russia right now, and that doesn't look great. Um, uh, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, most of the liberals are like on the side of like, well, we'll just we'll just keep tweaking the system that got us into World War I. And yeah. a lot of people are like, that doesn't seem good. That don't seem good either. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, need a, I, need a, I need an option D, Jake. Yeah, I'm poor. My government oh, no, sucks. Is. I have no hope for the future. What's up, Jake? This guy is saying it'll be different. Dr. Fuck Jake. it. Yes. Let's see if it's different. You know? Yes, exactly. Uh, it's and like it's like when you're watching a, a basketball game and it's your two least favorite teams playing and you want both of them to lose, but there isn't yeah, a yeah. way for one of them not to. Like somebody has to win. So there somebody has to, has be, to win. There has to be some sort of interference that makes it so that the game can't yeah. even happen. Yeah. And like, yeah otherwise, you're going to just pick your Joe, Joe, your Joe Biden. You get stuck you know? with Joe Biden. So you get stuck. Otherwise, with, you get yeah. Joe Biden. You get, you, yeah. Nobody wants that either. You know, <laughs> it's that, like, that's bad. That, that's what I'm like. Look, like do do not say, I, I, and I, I'm glad nobody has suggested that like Joe Biden is just a left wing like I version mean, of Trump. To where some I'm people like, no, he is a consolation prize. <laughs> he is, yeah. he's, he's the consolation settled, prize of the we, consolation prize. Yes, we settle for <laughs> Joe Biden. Like this yeah. nigga ain't the coming Messiah. He uh, <laughs> he he the disciple Bartholomew yeah. at best. You know he's what I'm saying? Barely like, conscious. He not yeah. even he not even Peter or John. My nigga. Like it was, <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a deep cut, boy. <laughs> My You're not even Paul, cuz like you Timothy. You ain't even write no book in the New Testament. I'm tearing up and my whole face is red. This is so oh, man, that's so funny. funny. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a that's a that's an evangelical joke. So that's the first part of this behind the insurrection Yay, series. Part, one. part motherfucking one. Uh yes. Pop, where can people follow you? Oh Lord, please follow me at Prop Hip Hop on all them things. Um uh, yeah, all the all of the Twitters and Instagrams. Um, you could my website, profitpop.com backslash coffee. Yeah, that is my website. <laughs> and we do coffee stuff there. Um, got some pods, uh, hood politics with prop, uh, which is um political analysis just from like, you know, if you survived eighth grade, <laughs> you could you understand <laughs> geopolitics. <laughs> you know, I just kind of giving you political analysis. So. Yeah, so that's 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 my that's my thanks. And uh, we'll we'll be, we'll be back soon, Robert. Yep, we will be back soon. We'll be back to talk about the Munich Beer Hall Putsch um, next yeah. week, um, and then we'll talk about some other shit. And then we're gonna end this talking in broad about why fascists win when they win and why fascists lose when they mm -hmm. lose. You're a gift to the world, Robert. Uh, like, like, like socks.
nice pair of socks. Robert doesn't know how to take compliments. As you can, right. as I've, exhibited, I've noticed. As exhibited I've noticed. By yeah, what I'm just going to run away from my computer now. Goodbye. <laughs> That's the episode. <laughs> <laughs>